Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. My name is Brendan Madigan, and I am the owner of Alpenglow Sports here in Tahoe City, California. And I would like to welcome you to the second show of our 15th annual Winter Speaker Series presented by Peak Design. The Alpenglow Winter Speaker Series has a twofold goal. One, to inspire and motivate all mountain athletes to pursue their dreams and two, to educate about and raise funds for nonprofit organizations making a tangible difference here in our North Lake Tahoe and Truckee communities. Each season consists of five free shows from the most inspirational athletes in the outdoor industry, such as Alex Honnold, Lynn Hill, Jeremy Jones, Tommy Caldwell, Hillary O'Neill, Glenn Plake, and many more. Normally, our community packs the house at Squaw Valley Alpine Meadows, and the energy is absolutely electric. Over 15 years, raffle and bar proceeds, along with donations from our anonymous philanthropic group, the Donor Party, have raised more than $750,000 for Lake Tahoe nonprofits. And we've come a long way since the days of living room style shows, and we're able to offer this to you primarily via the generosity of our sponsors. Peak Design, a San Francisco Bay Area company that leads with integrity and honors human values is once again the title sponsor of the series. Not only do they make the coolest camera and travel gear ever, literally, they honor and believe in the power of adventure storytelling and how it can connect us in a time of seemingly massive disconnection. They've also recently created Climate Neutral, a progressive environmental nonprofit that allows companies to offset and reduce all of their greenhouse gas emissions. We should also thank Cody sponsors who have kicked down in a massive way with over $5,000 in giveaways tonight. These sponsors include Solomon, Yeti, Smith Optics, Local Grown Arcade Belts, Sufferfest Beer, Squaw Valley Alpine Meadows, and Hestra Gloves. Now, one of the most rewarding things for me personally about the series is that a tight group of local companies support our event because they believe in our mission and the power of adventure storytelling. These include Narona, Tahoe Mountain Realty, Porter Simon Law Group, The Backcountry, KTKE 101.5 Truckee Tahoe Radio, Technical Equipment Cleaners, The Tahoe Weekly, The Rice Team at Guild Mortgage, Evolve Design Works, Mount Lincoln Construction, Sierra Nevada, and Smart Wool. Now, as I mentioned earlier, one half of our mission is to educate about and raise funds for local nonprofits right here in Lake Tahoe. The nonprofit beneficiary this evening is the Boys and Girls Club of North Lake Tahoe. And I'd like to welcome my friend, Mindy Carbajal, to inform us about the positive impact this amazing organization is having in our community. Here's to you, Mindy. Hello, my name is Mindy Carbajal. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Boys and Girls Club in North Lake Tahoe. I'm so excited to be here tonight and so excited that all of you are here this evening. And I want to say special thank you to the Alpenglow Winter Speaker Series uh, for everything they're doing to help our local uh, nonprofits and uh, community members uh, during these times. Uh, the Boys and Girls Club has been supporting youth on the North Shore and in Truckee for nearly 25 years. Uh, we provide uh, hope, opportunity, uh, and uh, great activities for youth all over the region um, in four locations, uh, Kings Beach, Truckee, uh, two sites in Truckee actually, and Incline Village, Nevada. Uh, kids access our programs before school, after school, school breaks, um, summer vacations. Uh, basically, when school's out, the Boys and Girls Club is in. We provide kids with 
activities, opportunities uh, to participate in sports, character and leadership, uh, education, you name it, uh, you can find it at the club. And our goal really is to provide experiences to kids that they can't find anywhere else, whether it's performing arts, aviation, uh, you name it, we've got it at the Boys and Girls Club. On uh, March 13th, uh, you know, just like the rest of the, uh, the world, the Boys and Girls Club, we had to shut our doors uh, briefly due to the, the COVID pandemic, but we knew that our kids still needed us. They still needed the meals uh, that we provide uh, for our kids daily, and uh, they need the support from our staff and those familiar faces. And so, uh, you know, we immediately switched services um, to make sure our kids still had a Boys and Girls Club. Uh, we came up with a virtual club. Uh, we served nearly 35,000 meals in a nine-week period to our entire community, uh, thanks to so many partners who helped us make that possible. Uh, we created activity packs and distributed them to our families uh, so that kids had activities to do at home. Uh, but we knew the most important thing for us to do uh, was to get our doors open the moment we could. And so on June 15th, uh, we opened our doors. Uh, we, we welcomed kids back into our club, uh, youth of essential workers, kids in disadvantaged circumstances, uh, and whatever that looked like. Um, and we started serving kids and giving them a place to be again uh, with our staff. Uh, right now, we're still running full day programs. Uh, we're supporting the distance learning model that our school districts are doing. Uh, we, are, we are there for kids uh, before school, after school, and when they're not in school and when schools are closed. Uh, we couldn't do it without the support of our community. Uh, we couldn't do it without people like you uh, that, that are here this evening watching this. And uh, you know that's what's allowed us to respond and to continue to serve our kids and make sure that they have a Boys and Girls Club. Uh, so thank you so much for being here. If you wanna learn more about the Boys and Girls Club, go to either our Facebook, find us on Facebook, uh, go to our website at bgcnlt.org. Uh, but thank you to our, our community for everything you guys do. And thank you to the Alpenglow Winter Speaker Series uh, for uh, this wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you so much, Mindy. You're such a rock star. We love the Boys and Girls Club of North Lake here. Uh, before I get into the raffle, which uh, is, is terribly exciting and it took me, a, like no joke, a couple hours to put this thing together today. There's so much stuff. I wanna remind everyone that all of your raffle, sorry, your giveaway proceeds benefit the Boys and Girls Club of North Lake Tahoe tonight. And uh, you can continue to donate throughout the show through the donation button at the bottom of your screen. Additionally, there's a chat function that we'd love you to participate in. And uh, therein, you can upvote questions for Cody um, that we'll address after the show in our live Q&A. But without further ado, let's get to this raffle because it is terribly exciting. Uh, first up, we have our first winner, Mark Chin. And I believe that was our first winner. We've got a $25 gift certificate to Technical Equipment Cleaners, a uh, beloved local business here. And congrats to Mark Chin. You, know, you can get your sleeping bag or your down puffy clean for your next backcountry adventure. Uh, next up, we have a his and her set of arcade belts valued at 60 bucks. Arcade is also a homegrown business here in Lake Tahoe. Congrats, Stuart Knightley, you are the winner. And you can wear both if you don't have a significant other. Uh, next up is a Peak Design tut, uh, Tech Pouch. This is a $60 pouch for all your uh, wired accessories. And the winner there is Jesse Ernst. Congrats, Jesse Ernst. And tonight what we're doing, guys, is we're going up in dollar value until the grand prize, which is uh, about a $1,400 package. Our fourth item is a four pack of arcade belts. Got some great patterns here for, for all your adventures and lifestyle wear. Congrats to Aaron Waddy. You are the winner of four belts. You can cycle them even if you don't have four pairs of pants. Uh, next up, we have a tech uh, gift certificate as well as an arcade Jessup suspender set. 
and that is value at $140. Here we are. Congrats to Zach Termath. Congrats, Zach. Okay, uh, now we're starting to build up in cost, guys. We've got the Smith Vita Backcountry Helmet here, and it is valued at $150. Bucks. And let's see who our winner is there. The anticipation is building. And our winner is Amy Connor. Congrats, Amy Connor. You have a sick new helmet from Smith. Maybe Amy Connor will win this next uh, giveaway prize. It's from Smith as well. Skyline goggles at valued at $170. And our winner for the Smith Skyline goggles is Jacob Antoon. Congrats, Jacob. Thanks for tuning in. Our seventh raffle item is a pair of Lakey gloves, uh, sorry, uh, Hestra gloves of your choice. These are uh, anything up to $175 in value. And congrats, Patrick Sheehan. You have some sick new gloves from a very amazing company there in Hestra. Next up, we've got a Solomon MTN Backcountry Lab helmet valued at $200. I don't have this, but uh, Solomon will ship it to you. It's an awesome helmet. The winner there is Brian Walker. Congrats, congrats Brian Walker. You got a new lid for your, for your backcountry stees there. Next up, we've got a Monday through Friday day pass, a uh, single day pass to uh, Squaw, Val Squaw Valley Alpine Meadows, as well as a co-brand Yeti mug from Squaw. Um, super grateful for Squaw's support uh, in Cody's show tonight. And Brian Yedlick, you are the winner of that awesome stuff. Next up, we've got a $240 pair of Smith IOMAG XL Cody Townsend model goggles. They're super nice to come with a spare lens for low light conditions. And the winner is Naomi McGinn. Congrats, Naomi. You'd be looking good on the hill or passing that on um, at a sweet Christmas party. Next up, uh, we have a two night stay at the Tahoe Vistana Inn, courtesy of our friends at Kelly Brothers Painting and Simple Power Solar. And this is valued at $300. Um, you have to come join us for an adventure here on the North Shore in Tahoe Vista. And the winner is Ali Agui. I know Ali lives in Reno, so she's going to be planning some some uh, strategic powder days there in Tahoe Vista. Uh, next up, guys, we're getting into some expensive stuff. We have a Sufferfest beer bundle, which, you know, asterisk here, you must live in California or Nevada to win this. But it also comes with a Yeti 35 uh, cooler, courtesy of Sufferfest. Um, and that is a cooler that you can get about 30 beers in. So uh, it'll be ready for you in, at the car uh, after an epic day in the, in the backcountry. Uh, Andrea Wilder, you're the winner. Congrats, Andrea. And next up, we have a 45 liter Yeti cooler. Now, this is a hard case cooler. Um, we've got some Navy ones on display here. Uh, this is a family heirloom that is uh, worth 300 bucks. So let's see who is going to be stoked to win that. All right, Timothy Polak, congrats. You are the winner. Okay, next up, we have a GoPro Hero 8, courtesy of our friends at Squaw Valley Alpine Meadows. Um, so you can film yourself uh, or your friends getting rad here in the, in the backcountry. The winner is Kimberly Bloom. Congrats, Kimberly Bloom. You are the winner of an epic new camera, valued at $350. Uh, next up, we have a package. We have a pair of $200 Tour Stick Vario Carbon poles from Lakey and a pair of Hestra gloves that uh, you can pick any glove that's $175 or less from Hestra. And let's see who the winner is there. Seeing a lot of names fly by. Amanda Tennant. All right, Amanda. Amanda is the better half of Chris Tennant, who is uh, Mount Lincoln Construction and who has been a, 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 an awesome supporter of the speaker series for many years. Okay, we've got three prizes left. Uh, the 18th wrap, uh, sorry, giveaway is a women's Vantage helmet from Smith. 
It's a $240 helmet and a one uh, time day pass Monday to Friday from Squaw Valley Alpine Meadows. And that is valued at $440. All right, congrats, Paul Hamill. You are the winner. You can look good, uh, function well, and have a great uh, day at Squaw Valley Alpine Meadows. So the next uh, second to last giveaway prize here, guys, is uh, two hard case uh, Yeti coolers, a Tundra 45 and a Tundra 65. This is $650 worth of Yeti coolers. And uh, you would definitely pass these on to your kids because they literally last forever. Our winner is going to be, no way, Brian Schusterman. Schusty, you are so stoked. Jeff Dosti, I'm sure, will deliver these since you are neighbors. Congrats, Brian Schusterman. You're always such a great fan and supporter of the Speaker Series. We love you. And that gets us to our grand prize. We have th a three-item package. It's a Peak Design carbon fiber uh, travel tripod here. This is the small setting, but it's a full-size tripod that is absolutely beautiful. We have the best-in-class Solomon MTN Pure Backcountry Binding right here. You can't get any better for skiability and lightweight than this from our friends at Solomon. And lastly, we have a $200 pair of Lakey Torstick Vario collapsible backcountry poles for your next adventure. And guys, that's uh, thirteen dollars or $1,400 uh, worth of gear. And let's see who our grand prize winner is. Okay, Ali Lair, you are the winner. You are fired up because you just won a bunch of amazing stuff. So congrats, Ali Lear, and cheers to Sufferfest. Okay, so back in July, when we started to consider what a virtual speaker series would look like, I honestly wasn't convinced we could pull it off. The series has grown into a large scale event that is expensive to put on and our team had reservations about just how well a small shop could reinvent the series in another successful format. But I knew deep in my heart that we absolutely, without doubt, had to find a way to do it. We couldn't cave into a lack of budget or be paralyzed by an oppressive global pandemic um, or even settle for a year off. My team and myself felt this way because we have an obligation to you, our mountain community, uh, this year that is tuning in from all across the globe, as well as our local nonprofits who need the help now more than ever. People and nonprofits are hurting. And if we had even the tiniest of platforms to make a difference in our community, it was morally imperative for us to do so. And I've learned the power of adventure storytelling from mentors like Dave Nettle and our other amazing guests who have come through our ranks through the years. And this speaker series has taught me that words have real power and not in the make-believe sense, but in the sense they can launch a life and make a difference. And how vital is that right now? After Dave Nettle's kickoff show in November, where assuredly everyone was inspired to go send on the cliff and in the backcountry, we also received a very special message that I'd like to share with you. A friend of Dave's watched the show with her father, who was in the midst of battling cancer. When Dave spoke so eloquently like Dave does, how we should approach adversity in our lives or in the mountains, this gentleman broke down in tears. He said that was what he needed to hear most at that exact moment. And that is very special and heartwarming and difference-making stuff. And both myself and our team are completely honored to bring it to life here for you. So here's to you the global mountain community, the quiet karma of our anonymous philanthropic donor party, and of course, the one and only Cody Townsend. 
Together this evening, we've raised over $75,000 for the Boys and Girls Club of North Lake Tahoe. This makes me happy beyond measure. But now, I'd like to invite you to enjoy Cody Townsend and his show. Well, welcome everybody. Thanks for attending the speaker series and thanks for your donations. It means a lot for our community. And tonight we're gonna to be telling some stories. Uh, right now we're gonna be telling the three pinnacles, essentially three stories from the 50 Project so far. And if you don't know what the 50 Project is, it is my goal to try and climb and ski all of the 50 classics as chronicled in the book, The 50 Classic Ski Descents of North America. So there's a lot of stories to tell, but these are kind of three highlight stories. So start getting right into it. And we'll start off with the very beginning, which is me and my first time skiing. <laughs> so I grew up here in, uh, in Squaw Valley. I grew up in Santa Cruz, but Squaw Valley was my home. It's where I learned to ski. And uh, I fell in love with skiing from a very young age. Like, I don't know exactly the moment I decided I wanted to be a skier, but I was probably between two and six because I do remember being six years old and thinking to myself, I'm going to be a skier. And it might have happened before then because I absolutely fell in love with it. And my entire life's focus was pretty much skiing. So even though I grew up at the beach, all I could think about was coming up to the mountains. And I grew up on the Mighty Mites, the Squaw Valley Race Team, and just doing everything in my power to become a, a skier of some sort. And then the life part two. So still me, still absolutely obsessed with skiing, but it took a new form. And I started to actually become the skier that I always dreamed of becoming. At first it started with ski racing. I tried to go to the Olympics, be on the US ski team. I kind of got burnt out on that and got drawn in by the free ski movement. Spent 10 years traveling around the world, filming out of helicopters, snowmobiles, and trying to ski kind of the most insane lines in the world, which is what this one is called and properly went viral on YouTube. I think it was, was on Sports Center and all that stuff. And it's what most people these days know me for. And it was also a big turning point personally in my life because life part three involves this, which is now climbing up mountains to ski back down them. Some people call it ski mountaineering. Some people don't. Some people just call it backcountry skiing. I just call it climbing up and skiing back down. And how I got to this point in that transition period needs a little bit of a backstory as well. And it all started in 2015 in this place, Svalbard. So this is the northernmost Norway. Uh, it's actually the northest, northernmost mountains in the world, 600 miles from the North Pole. And I got invited on this trip um, to go up to Svalbard in March. And after I skied the crack, after the line went viral, a lot of people were asking me like, hey, what's next? And I honestly didn't know. I felt like I kind of tapped out my potential, all my dreams, kind of everything I'd want to do in that style of free ride skiing. And I started searching almost elsewhere. I didn't want to kind of keep going down that same path. And so that very next year, I kind of called it quits on the free ride stuff. I actually stopped filming with the main film company I was working for and looked for other things. And I got invited on this trip to do the film Eclipse, and the, the plan was to go to Svalbard in March and camp out on a glacier for two to three weeks while we tried to shoot this eclipse. Well, the first requisite to go on the trip was I was asked by the producer of the film Eclipse, he's like, hey, have you ever been winter camping before? I was like, yeah, totally, <laughs> completely have. And Although that wasn't a complete lie, it pretty much was a lie because I had camped one day in the snow in my life. I'll get into it actually later in the slideshow. And it was on Mount Talak. It was about 50 degrees and it was about, I don't know, half mile away from the road. So really nothing to uh, kind of prepare me to going to the Arctic in March where the temperatures were between minus 20 to minus 50. So, but I kind of felt like I could do this. I'll figure it out. And sure enough, on that trip, although it was challenging at times, I was asking myself, why did you do this? This is cold, this is hard, this is gnarly, it is not powder. After a few days, I started to get really comfortable. And at the end of the trip, it was just like one of the most special, important trips of my life. And I absolutely fell in love with that style of expedition skiing. So then 
That same year, I decided and planned a trip up to remote BC. I went up there with two close friends and kind of mentors to, to myself, being uh, Chris Rubens and Dave Treadway. And what we did was we were in northern BC. We snowmobiled up about 55 miles from the road. We set up a big base camp and then we'd snowmobile from there up to 100 miles in a day, all in the goal of getting to mountains like this and climbing up them to ski back down. And it was my first trip going with no guides. It was just only ourselves to create the, the plan, the safety, and get around the mountains on it by ourselves. So it was a big step, step forward for me. And at the end of the trip, we ended up finding this face. And this is on Mount Frank Mackey, which is the largest peak in that, that zone where we're in. And we ended up climbing and skiing that. And that was like the, the tip of the end of the trip. And I will tell you, I was at the bottom of that nearly vomiting um, because I was so scared before going up it. And with Chris and Dave, we went to the summit got to the top of it. I remember it was like late in the evening. It was like six, was almost seven at night. Sun's going down and I realized like, oh my God, you got to ski back down. There's no helicopter to come pick you up. If you don't want to, you can't survive up here. You've got to get down. So we ended up skiing that. And it's funny because although I'd skied stuff like that, steep like that in Alaska before, that was truly the first time I felt like that scared and felt like the energy of the mountain and the power of the mountains. And it was just, we got to the end of it. And I remember just being like, there's something more here. And I was like, absolutely on a different level for a few days after that. I mean, we were celebrating, nearly crying, hugging, and it just felt like this is something bigger than what I have been doing. And I got more hooked. To even then, I went back to kind of the proving grounds to Alaska. In 2016, went to the Todrilo Mountains to a place very close to where I'd skied the crack, but I'd been there three times before, and this time we went without a helicopter. And went up there, and I learned more in my two weeks of spent time camping on this glacier and climbing lines about the snowpack of Alaska, about the lines of Alaska, and about how the mountains work up there than I did in the 10 years of heli skiing I'd been doing previous to that. And I just realized there's this untapped world I'm just learning about and tapping into. And I just, again, started to get more and more hooked. And that's when I started dreaming about this book. And we all know the 50 Classic Ski Descents of North America it came out in 2010. I actually got a copy of it. Um, I remember leafing through it and being like, cool, a lot of cool pictures and seems like cool mountains. But it didn't really speak to me because I was still kind of in my free ride downhill performance mindset. This book is definitely much uh, along the lines of ski mountaineering and like big objective style skiing. And I was definitely not in that mindset. But after 2014 and these new experiences, I remember picking the, back, the book back up after this trip, thinking about what's next for me. And all of a sudden, you know, one line, I'm like, I better ski that line before I die. And then all of a sudden two, and then three and four, and then five, six, and all of a sudden it was just like, at one point I remember thinking, I was like, why don't you just try and ski all of them? And then that, that thought really intimidated me. I was all of a sudden at this point like, no, this seems incredibly hard. You are still super new to this. This is something that is out of your reach, but I couldn't get it out of my mind. And I kept dreaming about it, kept dreaming about it. I ended up going back, filming with MSP, kind of going back to these original roots I'd formed, but couldn't get it out of my mind. So at one point, when I couldn't keep getting it out of my mind, I realized that I needed a test. I needed this personal thing, a challenge for myself to tell myself, like, could you do this? Could you commit to actually skiing all, all 50 of these and try to at least do it? And there's almost like no better testing grounds for ski mountaineering than the Alaska range. And in 2017, I set off on my very first expedition because as I told you before, everything I'd done before was all like base camping trips. This was gonna be my first true expedition in a certain way to climb and ski Denali. And I'd seen Denali a lot, um, just like these uh, ambulances going by, <laughs> but uh, I'd seen Denali a ton in my time spent heli skiing up there. You can see it from hundreds of miles around and it draws your eye in. And I just remember thinking, I was like, kind of got up to that list one day. I was like, one day I want to do that, but 
it was so far out of my mind of even being able to do that it didn't even seem possible. And as I started dreaming about these book and started having these experience, I was like, no, this is Denali. That's the place. This is going to be your first time at altitude. This is your first expedition style trip. And uh, I just needed kind of a plan for it. And luck be have it, in 2017, as I was still kind of filming, doing the normal stuff I did in like my previous ski career, I'd heard through the grapevine that this guy on the left, Ian McIntosh, and this guy on the right, Johnny Collinson, were going to be going up to Denali in June to climb and ski it for kind of a, almost like a trial run and training trip for themselves. They had some bigger goals in the Himalaya and they wanted to use this trip as like, hey, this is where we'll get ready for that. And so I just called up Ian, called up Johnny, and I was like, hey, guys, like, could I come? Like, are you, you guys looking for another partner? And they were like, yeah, sure, we're not filming. I was, yeah, sure, if you guys want to come. Um, and so I invited my way onto a trip to Nali. And then uh, the little girl in red, I don't say little girl, she's a full woman, but my friend Michelle Parker, she found out I was going and then did the same thing and by herself. So we had this awesome crew, and we set off in June to uh, climb and ski Denali. And I'll never forget when, you know, the, the plane flies you in, drops you off at the landing spot. And as we were going down Heartbreak Hill with your 100 pound sled of all your gear that you're bringing up the mountain, you know, you don't have porters, you don't have Sherpas, you're responsible for our, all of it. And as we're skiing away from the plane and from like kind of these last ditch comforts going like, oh my God, like I'm going to go to trying to ski Denali for the first time. And this is my first time doing any sort of expedition like that. And it was this blend of just like absolute nervousness, kind of what is going to happen along the way. And then obviously excitement just to be like, yes, you're finally, you're doing this. Like this is your, your chance. Um, and then the test, I had my first real challenge. So this is day three. So day one, you get dropped off in the plane. We went to a camp about 7,500 feet. Uh, it's about a couple miles from where you get dropped off. Stayed there, rested one night, and then we're going from 7,000 to 11,000 foot camp. And that day, um, we're as we're trudging up, like this is our first kind of climbing day. It had been flat since then uh, to that point. And we knew we had 4,000 vertical feet to cover. We knew we had all day, but we knew we had 120 pound sleds and tons of gear that we're going to have to haul out there. It was our first challenge. And I was on the back of the back of the group because as the, I've always learned with glacier travel, you put the heaviest and biggest guy in the back. So I'm always in the back and it's fine because I'm generally like the slowest, I, I would say as well. But as we're going up, man, I am just loving it. I am like cranking up those hills, like to the point where the rope is going a little slack and I'm going like, why are these guys going so slow? I would have music on my headphones because like there's no hazards you have to listen out for. I was like literally just like dancing. I'm like, yeah, this is awesome. And I'm like feeling so good about myself. I'm like, man, you are a mule. You are a freaking, <laughs> you are a, a, like, you're a Clydesdale. You can pull this stuff up. These guys are slow. They're not fit. And uh, I was like, this is, this whole mountain's gonna be an absolute breeze. And we got to 11,000 foot camp, and that's when I learned the truth of the day. So any high altitude trip, and this being my first one, started to do some research, and they say, everyone says like, hey, you gotta bring certain drugs, being Diamox and Dexamethasone. Diamox can help you acclimatize, and Dexamethasone is for emergency. Um, they kind of call it the zombie drug. It's for a rescue style thing. So we get up to, to camp at 11,000 feet, and the next day we're planning to go to 14, and there's another guy on the trip named Shane Treat. And Shane is a volunteer patrol up on Tenali, and he'd spent a month up there, but he'd actually never been to the summit, so he wanted to join us for the trip. Uh, he flew off the mountain, joined us, we start going up. Well, Shane asks at one point, he's like, oh, since we're going up to 14 to tomorrow and we're starting to get to more altitude, just want to double check like who, what drugs we have, all that kind of stuff, just in case something goes wrong or people feel weird. And I was like, oh yeah, I, I went to a doctor's office and I got Diamox and Dexamethasone. He's like, great, great. He's like, are you taking the Diamox um, to help acclimatize? And I was like, no, no, but I am taking the Dexamethasone <laughs> and his like eyes just grew into saucers and he's looking at me and he's like you say, you say what you, you're taking the dexamethasone I was like 
yeah, like I, I went to the doctor, my local doctor, and I got the prescription and uh, the doctor coached me through it, wrote out that you're supposed to take two tablets of dexamethasone in the morning and in the evening <laughs> and take it all the way up the mountain until you get off. <laughs> and he looks at me, he's like, no, no, you're <laughs> not supposed to do that at all. He's like, dexamethasone's like an incredibly powerful steroid. And I'm just at this point going like, oh, it all makes sense of why I was running up the mountain today. <laughs> but it wasn't actually kind of that joking of a matter because as we, he, he kind of gets confused and he's realizing like, wait a minute, the doctor said this, but like, wait, am I confused? So we went down to the ranger tent because um, there's a ranger tent pretty much at every camp on Denali because there's such a popular mountain. We go down there, we check in, and the, the ranger, she, she says to me, she's like, wait, you're, you're on dexamethasone? I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I, that was what I was told to. And she's like, you need to stop right now. I'm like, well, well what's, what's the issue? And she's like, what dexamethasone does is it doesn't let your body actually acclimatize. It essentially masks the acclimatization process. And she says, so this whole way up so far, you're not acclimatizing. And if you, let's say, go to 17,000 feet and get caught in a storm up there and you run out of decks, you will die. You will die within a couple hours. And at that point, I just was like, oh my God, like I've made a very near fatal mistake. And all of a sudden, all my doubts kind of started flooding back, being like, you're not prepared for this. Like you couldn't, you couldn't even bring the proper research to, to, climbing is key in Denali and you're taking the right, the wrong drugs. I was listening to a doctor, but it ultimately fell on myself. And that night, I remember as I learned all this, I was laid in my tent and I could feel my like heart for the first time. I realized it is absolutely beyond palpitating. It is just beating like a thousand beats per minute. I can feel like this almost like nervous energy, almost like electricity going through me. And I was laying there realizing I'm like, am I going to wake up tomorrow? Like, am I gonna die tonight? And it really honestly scared me. My only thought that comforted me is I'd spent some time, pretty much the entire training for this trip was here in the High Sierra. I'd been going to 11,000, 12,000, 13, 14,000 feet for the month beforehand. And we got off, got off that and pretty much went to Denali. So I felt like maybe we're at 11,000, I'll be okay. And sure enough, I ended up getting to sleep that night. I'll say it took me a long time to fall asleep thinking that you might not wake up in the morning. And as you can see, I'm still standing here. I woke up in the morning and we did our first double carry the next day. And I'd say I didn't feel the greatest. I was coming off heavy steroids, but we made it up the first challenging motorcycle hill, which is where this is at. Um, made it all the way to 14 camp and our plan was to double carry. We were carrying half our load, some of our fuel and our food up to 14 camp and come back down to 11 camp where our tents were set up and sleep one more night there to get back the next day. And felt okay. It was definitely a struggle. I was happy to be w woken up. And as we got to 14, that's when things started going not okay. Uh, we got up there and we actually ran into local friends, Jim Morrison and Hillary Nelson, and they just come off of summiting and skiing Denali and they were fired up. We see friends out there, we're all hanging out. Uh, the, ironically, uh, we, the whole team was pulling off shots of whiskey at 14,000 feet, which made pretty much everyone around the camp looking at us with awe. But I definitely wasn't because I felt really bad. My head was pounding. I could, feel, I could almost like not even talk. I was super nauseous. And to the point where I was sitting there just kind of dazed and dizzy while everyone's talking and I just took off. I skied back down to 11 camp by myself. It's not the smartest thing to do, but I realized I'm like, I'm in a bad spot right now. And I raced back down to 11 camp, laid back down. And luckily the next morning woke up and for the first time felt that all gone. And I was so thankful again, but still it kind of dawned on me. I was like, man, that was a dumb, fuck up man like that was that was something that could have killed you and you're on this mountain you almost let this like random thing outside of the mountain already get to you so i knew still i had more to go and as as we finally got to 14 camp we set up our camp and my goal was that martini shaped couloir above camp called the mezziner couloir 
And I still didn't tell a single soul about this, this goal of mine, this thought idea about the 50. And I was going up there with the explicit intentions to try and ski the Messner. Obviously it was in condition, but that was my goal. And I didn't let anyone know. I was just like, yeah, let's, I'd like to ski the Messner, just kind of like casually, like it looks really cool, but I still couldn't like publicly commit to this. I think I'd like mentioned it to my wife at least once, but not a soul knew about it. I had this fear of, of speaking it out loud would speak it to life and make it come like I had to do it. And I knew that I still had a lot, a lot to go for it. So I stared up at the Mesner every day, took pictures of it, studied it. And we did one rest day at 14 camp and then went up to 17,500 foot camp for our first kind of acclimatization day. And you can see camp at 14,000 feet right above those, uh, those crevasses and Johnny hanging out like the model he is on top of a prominent peak. And it was really cool because everything felt good again. I felt strong and every step I took above 14 camp was the highest I'd ever been in my life. So I was joking around the whole time. It was like, this is the highest I've ever been. This is the highest I've ever been. This is the highest I've ever been. Probably annoying the hell out of my teammates, but it was really funny to me. And uh, we ended up doing our first ski run down the rescue gully. Um, Rescue Gully is named because it's actually where they lower people on 2,000 foot ropes and evacuees out of it. It goes pretty much direct access to, to 14 camp. But for us as skiers, it's an incredible ski line. Um, and what we found was absolutely perfect snow. It was like nice duffy wind kind of like wind buff um, on top of like smooth hard pack, no stability issues, just flying and having good times. And it was, that was kind of the test run since it was the same aspect, like the measure is going to be good. And we could see that it didn't have a spot of ice, which we had heard it had pretty much been unskiable for three years prior to our arrival. So we were, we were quite stoked. Everything looked aligned and we did one more rest day. And then on day nine, we went to the summit and kind of spare you the details of the climb because as as is advertised, uh, Denali is a bit of a slog on um, the West Buttress route. It's nothing technical. It's nothing super challenging other than the weather and the altitude. And I will say it was feeling the altitude effects. Um, we were pretty quick to, to get to the summit being on day nine of our trip. Um, and I remember getting to about 19,000 feet at the football fields and it came over the ridge line and looked out over this beautiful horizon and I started crying. And I was just like, it's so beautiful. And I will blame it on the altitude, but maybe it was, it was really beautiful. Um, but maybe it also wasn't because I cried another time when I got to the summit, which was just that feeling of like, it really was pushing through hard. Those last hour was really, really difficult. And we got to the summit and it felt like, wow, we did it. Like we are here, we have this amazing moment. You can tell we're not even like full puffies. It was like only nine, minus 10 at the summit, not a breath of wind, and only the five of us on top of the summit just taking it all in. But as I told you before, I still had one thing to do, and that was ski the Mesner. And I did something pretty atypical, but I thought it was like a big breakthrough for myself. So I ended up skiing the Mesner solo. So the rest of the crew, um, Ian had been told by our buddy Sage that he needs to go ski the Orient Express. And there's a benefit to skiing the Orient Express as well because you can ski straight from the summit right to the top of the line. Whereas the Mesner, you actually have to take your skis back off, put your crampons on and hike up another maybe 200 feet and kind of like, uh, I don't know, another kilometer to get over to it. So being in our exhausted state and our lack of like true acclimatization, we that, that 200 foot hill definitely felt daunting. And so the whole crew went to um, Orient Express, but I was dead set on this. And I went, I, I was very confident. We had radios. I knew that the avalanche conditions were absolutely locked up. Plus it's a 5,500 foot couloir. If that thing slides, it's not like your partners are gonna come rescue you. So the hazard of having being solo was incredibly low. Um, like I said, we were radioed to each other's uh, parties so I could keep up progress. And although I did get a little lost getting into the entrance, which I had this wind little moment, I got down into it and looked down this, one of the probably top 10 runs of my life. Like imagine your best 
powder run at your favorite ski resort, so like a squat, like West Face or Shoot 75 on the perfect smooth powder day, yeah, that's like 1,000 feet, 1,500 vertical feet. Feels like it goes on forever. That goes on for 5,500 vertical feet. And I remember just making like GS turns and super G turns and just laughing and being like, where am I by myself at 10 at night when this picture was taken, just skiing one of the best ski lines of my life. Only difference was after about five, six turns, you definitely have to pull over and start heaving because you're like, because <gasps> you're at 19,000 feet. But ultimately, everything went great. The skiing was amazing. Is actually way better than their skiing too, which I actually kind of <laughs> knew um, because the aspects you could tell on a rescue day, I was like, the, the aspect of what the Orient is, is like pretty wind hammered and the Mesner looks more filled in. And sure enough, it was. So they were all a little jealous because I got down to the bottom and they're like, how was it? I was like, oh, it was amazing. They're like, oh, it was horrible on the Orient. So, <laughs> so I lucked out and I ticked off number one of the 50 to me. I mean, I'd skied a few of them before, some of the easy ones. But truly, that was like what it felt like the start. And I felt like I kind of passed the test. And not only did I, I get across some of these hurdles I put up for myself, I learned a lot along the way. And I learned that I truly, truly love the, the style of skiing. And that, to me, was the, the, the trip that cemented the 50 in my mind. And I knew it was the only thing I was going to do. But. Um, there was one last thing as a key to ski mountaineering that they never teach you about. So we always talk about gear and stuff. You got to poop in bags and you got to carry it off the mountain. So um, I just wanted to point that out that if you're interested in this, you have to deal with that because no one really told me when you're pooping in the same can as all your friends, it gets really gross and really stinky <laughs> and carrying it down is terrible, but it's really important because we don't want to destroy it up there. So. Um, yeah, that was the other thing I learned about it. Um, but um, with the project kind of cemented in my mind, I still knew I had a lot to learn. And through the project and through kind of these goals, I knew like a lot of the ways I'm going to be learning these things. And so I look back to one story and I kind of, I focus it. And I was like, this was, this was your masterclass. This is where you took everything together. And like any good school, there's hollowed grounds and those hollowed grounds are the Tetons and the Grand Teton. I'd spent plenty of time in, in the Tetons, um, skiing in front of the cameras at TGR. And I mean, you see it from everywhere and you see, hear all the stories. And I knew, I was like, one day, man, you're gonna ski that, you're gonna ski that. But quite often I, I wouldn't ski it because the time it's skiable is March and April and that's when we're doing all our filming. And so it always kind of slipped my mind. And that was part of this goal as a 50, it was like, okay, you wanna ski it, just commit to it, you gotta go ski it. And so in late March of 2019, so last year, I heard the conditions were coming in and I heard a very specific teacher was coming back into town, a good buddy of mine, and he was the guy I wanted to go up the mountain with. And that guy is that guy, the Jimmy Chin. <laughs> so although he looks like the Oscar winner and kind of Hollywood makeup in this thing, um, that's what most people know him as. We in our ski community know he's by far one of the most legendary alpinists of all time and one of the most amazing ski mountaineers of all time. His mountain prowess, his mountain sense, his accomplishments in the mountains are pretty bar none. And uh, the, the Grand Teton, he's climbed uh, and skied so many times he doesn't even remember. He's like, it's been like 20, he did it three times in a week once, so he's, he's up there. So getting the chance to link up with Jimmy and go up the Grand, it really felt like I had the, the master class for, for this project. Um, and as we started to get ready, one of the things, we were in his amazing kind of gear, I don't know, gear den with marked with, you know, nuts marked with Maru and Everest and all these kind of things, and started going through all the gear. and. Um, the, the gear to me was still a little foreign at that point. I'd started to climb, started to get comfortable with it, but I don't think I was like comfortable in making those decisions. So going through it, it was like, how many ice axes do we need, Jimmy? Or how or ice axes, how many ice screws do we need? And we need cams and nuts or, how, and so going through that, I was like learning some of the, like getting that confidence. Like I felt like I knew, but it was truly like him being like, no, this is how it's done. So we get, got up our gear and 
we set off. So like as is typical for the Grand, you leave very early in the morning. I think this is about 2 a.m. when we started off. Um, and we started making our way up the mountain. And although I just brought up gear as being something important to ski mountaineering, uh, one thing I've learned and one thing I've learned from this day in particular is that ski mountaineering is not about ice axes and crampons and ropes. It's all the stuff and the paraphernalia we kind of associate with it. But to me, the most important point of ski mountaineering is all in your mind. And it's all your decision making. It's all your experience you bring to the table. Because a rope may catch your fall, but your mind will not let you fall to begin with. So as any good trip um, in the mountains, there is decision points and we faced one this day. So. We, when we woke up, we started, forecast was good. We saw five to 10 mile an hour winds in the forecast, mellow, seemed all good, cold temps. But we started going up and it was ripping like 60, 70 mile an hour winds. As you can tell, Jimmy's climbing in a puffy. You don't climb a 7,000 foot mountain in a puffy very often, but that's how cold it was. And the point, it was almost ripping us off our feet or like skis were acting like sails. And started getting really nervous thinking like, oh, this is probably, probably not going to happen today. And we got to this critical point. So the base of the Ford Stettner Kular. So everything up there has been mainly just ski touring and boot packing. But here is where the technical aspects of the Grand begin. And this is where there was can be up to five pitches of ice climbing. Um, and you're setting ice screws, tying into anchors, setting kind of protection. And we rounded this corner and looked up at this. The winds were absolutely nuclear. And I was really nervous. I'm like, here I'm going for, like I've like ice climbed like once, twice in my life, but we're going up the grand skis on my back. They're acting like sails and we're gonna go up there. And we sat there and we waited and we watched it. And we started evaluating what the hazards were. I'm like, well, the two main hazards on the grand are people and warming. And we didn't have either of those. There was not a single soul in that mountain that day besides us, probably for good reason, but there was nobody else out there. So people climbing above us, skiing above us, wasn't gonna be an issue. And then warming wasn't gonna be an issue either. So there's a lot of south and east facing aspects that can shed snow into you when you're in, in the Ford Stettner, but it was absolutely frigid, as I said. So the only thing that we kind of started talking about was like, well, it's only the wind. And once you kind of get in there, you're actually a little bit sheltered. And Jimmy, knowing the route so well, was like, there's no place for the wind to actually load up there for it to slide down through the Ford Stettner. So the hazards were actually quite low. And he looked at me and said, he's like, you know, I'm of the school that believes you go until it just doesn't make sense anymore. So I think we should just keep going until it doesn't make sense. And I remember when he said that, I was like thinking, I was like, wow, was that something like Conrad Anchor taught him? Or maybe that was something that Mug Stump taught Conrad Anchor. Or maybe that was someone that Mug Stump read about from like Mesner or someone else. Like and I realized I was like, oh my God, like we are just, I'm so fortunate right now learning and standing on the shoulders of these giants of, of mountaineering to be out here in the mountains and learning these lessons. So even though while I was nervous, it did make sense. And Jimmy was like, let's keep going. So we kept going. And that's when I got hit with my first ever alpine shower, um, which is when a, uh, about a 60 mile an hour gust comes down and sloughs out you while you're, on, you're climbing up. Um, but I remember, although I was nervous right below this, I, I came up after getting completely whited out and I started laughing and I said, well, I haven't had a shower in a while, so that felt good. <laughs> And I realized I was like, no, you're comfortable. The hazards are actually low, stayed glued to the wall. It's just a little wind. What's going to be bad about this? And we kept making our way up. And we got into the main part of the Kular where we've got like, I don't know, 300 feet of ice climbing. I say I was just, just having a blast. Like I definitely, like most people, have a fear of heights. As you start to go up stuff, you feel that exposure. And I remember going up the ice and just feeling like, a million bucks like this is amazing and we climbed up we got through the ice and i just was all of a sudden like on a different kind of level and i realized it was without jimmy i probably would have turned around and as we started getting up there the wind started to die and i started to learn some new techniques along the way 
And that's one thing I've started to learn in ski mountaineering is that it's sometimes a little looser than you expect. And there's a couple of things I learned that day, which is when you're tied into Jimmy Chin and he yells at you, don't fall, I didn't place any protection, don't fall. <laughs> I remember when he yelled that to me, he was about 10 feet from this place. He hadn't placed a single per piece of protection. I'm roped up to the end of the end of the rope with him. And I'm like, what? You didn't place protection? So if I fall, I'm going to be known as the guy that killed Jimmy Chin? <laughs> like, they won't be like Cody Townsend killed Jimmy Chin. It was like Jimmy Chin's partner killed Jimmy Chin. It's like, oh, God, Jimmy, what the hell? Uh, luckily, it was only about 10 feet. We had to move together without any protection. But I was like, OK, that was a little looser than I, than I thought. And then we got to this point, and uh, he told me, he's like, all right, why don't you take this next pitch? And I was like, all right, sounds good. And he's like, and if you fall, just try to fall this way, and I'll jump over this way, and we'll clothesline this, this big ridge, and we'll, we'll catch each other. <laughs> and uh, I said something that my mom is still very angry about. I just looked at him and was like, okay. And she was not very happy about that. So I learned there's some new techniques to move through fast things, and I learned some, um, some ways to try not to, to kill uh, a hero of alpinism so um, but we kept moving on and we got through pretty much what I would call the push and this is when the type 2 fun started to happen was I had been about 10 lines in on the project at this point I had already started to feel the the effects of skiing a lot of these big objective lines back to back um, and actually after this we went on a run of skiing nine peaks in four and a half weeks so but at this point, we were really pushing, and uh, I set off ahead. We kept just digging down deep and pushing through and getting up to one of the most beautiful summits I've ever stood on. And you're at a place, it's like the size of a dinner table, and you're looking out 100 miles around. You're standing pretty much hundreds of feet uh, higher than the next mountain around you. Truly feel like you are on top of the world. And it felt extra special. One, it had been something I've been looking at for a long time. Two, I was with these legends. My cameraman and partner, Bjarne Salen, who definitely came into this project with more experience in this type of scheme than I, and then and Jimmy. Um, as we started to get ready, we got prepped to, to ski back down. And as I ended the last little section with poop, this, I'll tell you, this one ends with the same. It was 7,000 feet of horrible skiing. <laughs> it was awful. But it was also funny because I didn't even care. Like, I'd spent my whole life chasing powder and chasing the fun sensations of going on the down. And somehow the up was more fun for the first time. I was like, I don't even care if I have to like walk down this mountain. That was amazing. And I realized like, okay, this is again, this next step. Like, I mean, I still prefer powder for sure, but if you have to slide down snow to get off a mountain, any type of snow is, is good with me. Um, so yeah, and that was kind of my, my master class with Jimmy Chin. But again, like any class, you go to the third aspect, which is the graduation. So the graduation um, for me, it happened last year as well. I don't know if it's an actual graduation, but it was kind of symbolic for me. And it starts with this mountain, uh, Meteorite Mountain in Alaska. So the first time I laid eyes on this mountain was actually my very first heli trip ever. Um, I think it was about, I was about 20 years old, 21 years old. I actually, I remember I spent half my annual income waiting tables on one two week heli trip up in Alaska. Um, I remember it was cost $11,000 the trip and I made $22,000 that year. But on the very first day of flying out, I remember we took off from the helipad, we flew straight over Meteorite, the backside, and I was on the window seat and I looked right down it and everyone, they started saying, this is Meteorite, this is the, the legendary line. I looked down and I was like, nope, no way. I'm not skiing that. There's no chance in hell I will ski that. Like, how do people get down that? Like, it was absolutely terrifying to me, like three and a half thousand vert of absolutely like butt puckering steeps and flying it over the heli. I just got my like stomach dropped out of me and I was just like, nope, nope, nope. But here I am like 15 years later coming back to the same mountain with a goal of not only skiing it, 
by climbing from the road to the top of it and then skiing back down. Um, but there's uh, like any kind of graduation or doctorate, you definitely have your like doctorate teacher, your fellow to bring you along. And that's this guy. And another local here, another legend, Jeremy Jones. And he's actually been a mentor for me longer than he actually knows. Because it all started with a local line here. Um, it's a line called the Dirty Tooth. So when I was like 17 years old, uh, maybe it was in 2000, 1999, 2000, Jeremy rode this and, and this line in a, one of the standard films back in the day. And I remember it was mind blowing, like unbelievably steep, looked super gnarly. Snowboarders weren't riding those kind of lines at this time and it was pretty groundbreaking. And I think it was a year later, I found the line. I was like, there it is, there's the dirty tooth. And I knew no one else had ridden it before. So I was about 18 years old and I set off, I'm like, I'm gonna ski the dirty tooth. And so the day we found it, hiked up around it and I dropped in on it. And I would say I hacked the hell out of it. I made my first turn and I sloughed myself out. I white roomed myself. I think I stopped like three times, chipped my way down. It was like the steepest thing I'd ever skied at that point. But I felt like I did it. I was the second person to ever to ride the dirty tube from the first skier. So of course, when I saw Jer in the KT line one day, it was the first thing I said to him. I don't think he knew who I was, but I came up to him and I was like, hey, I rode the dirty tooth. And he kind of was like, yeah. all right, kid, like, cool. And he's just like, that was my introduction to Jeremy of me bragging to him that I rode a line like him. So, um, but that was where it started. I realized that was kind of where I first started to be influenced by this guy. And then uh, as I started to evolve, I started to become a pro skier and make a name for myself and film with companies like TGR. I got to actually know him a little bit more. And I remember he actually called me one day out of the blue and he's like, hey, I want to ride Terminal Cancer, that uh, classic couloir in the Rubies, but he didn't necessarily know how to find it. And I had gotten to know him and I told him I like skied it a couple of times before that. And so we drove out to the Rubies together and we spent like three days riding in the Rubies together. And I just learned kind of tried to imbibe everything he was saying and learn from him, his snow evaluation, his kind of mountain sensei sense that he has. And the funny thing was that day that we skied Terminal Cancer Day was actually the inspiration for the crack because we hiked up it, we got to the top and Jared said to me, he's like, I want to ski this thing fast, I snowboard it, but I want to, I want to ride this fast. I want to like haul down it. And the times I'd skied it before, we just kind of hop turn our way down and go slow and whatnot. And that was the way that 99% of people had ridden it before. And Jared just takes off, he's hauling. I was like, all right, I guess I'm doing the same. And I just kind of started like start pointing it, but then it's just like a thousand fast slalom turns our way down it. And it was just like, came out of the bottom screaming and my legs were burning and just like, oh my God, that was incredible. And that day was when I started dreaming. I was like, I got to find the like the big version of that somewhere in Alaska. And it only took me about uh, eight years to find it, but ended up doing it. And uh, yeah, so Jer again, kind of teaching me the ways. And 2009, I'd mentioned this before. This was my very first winter camping trip. So <laughs> he called me at like eight at night. Um, this is right when he started the Deeper, Further, Higher trilogy. This was the first year of filming. And I think it was like January, but an unusually warm January. Like I said, it was like 50 degrees. He calls me at eight at night because I've been peppering. I'm like, hey, let's get out and do something. He's like, all right, we're going camping on Talak tomorrow. So I had no idea what to do other than just throw everything I owned as a, that was camping equipment into a bag, which was a... 12 pound, three season tent, like two and a half, three person tent, uh, a stove that was pretty much a Coleman stove that you cook out of your car with, like literally everything, and suffered my way up to this basin on Talac. Uh, I was so tired that day, because after we set up camp, we actually went up to the top of Talac and rode it three times. And I was so exhausted that the, the next day, I woke up and everyone's going like, dude, did you see that helicopter? It's like, no, what are you talking about? And they're like, literally a helicopter was hovering over your tent. I'm like, 
what? They're like, you didn't wake up? I was like, nope, not at all. And they're like, your tent was like blowing in the wind. It was over, like everyone was up. We didn't know what to do. We didn't know what it was. And yeah, so that was my first experience winter camping. Um, the next day I skied one line and took off because I was so exhausted. So um, again, Jer taking me on my first winter camping trip. And then in 2010, and it actually started a little bit before this, um, we started to travel in Europe together. We were both on Swatch and we got to do these contests and free ride royal tour contests, the Big Mountain Pro. And again, I just kept learning these lessons from him. I'll never forget, we were in Innsbruck and there was this day we wake up early in the morning, we go out to the mountains and it looks like the mountains are just falling apart. And there's just glide cracks everywhere, avalanche debris everywhere. And I'm like, not, why would we want to go out there? We had to traverse under this massive ridge line and then hike like 3,000 feet to the top of this thing. And he looks at me, he's like, he's like, all we have to do is be off this mountain by one o'clock and we're good. I was like, okay, like, I mean, it looks like a terror field out there. Why would we want to go do that? Sure enough, we traverse across there, all the frozen, uh, frozen debris, all these, we're climbing up all these glide cracks, get to the top, we ski our line, part of the contest, get down to the bottom. We're at the bottom, drinking beers, hanging out in the sun, enjoying it. Two o'clock rolls down, the entire face we're climbing slides, a like class three climax avalanche. And I'm like, oh my God, that was such a close call. And Jared looks at me, he was like, timing in the mountains is everything. And I realized again, just continually learning these lessons along the way. And then I also realized I was always in his footsteps too. Like I would go out to the Todrilo Mountains and I'd like look at lines like this, like uh, Shackleton's. And he's the first guy to ride it. And no one else has ridden it since. And I always tried to dream of riding it and conditions never came in. And then in 2016, when I did that base camping trip in Alaska, we climbed up and skied this wall, which Jer named, called the Wizard of Oz. Um, they had ridden, him and Travis Rice had ridden it for the first time, and we were the first ones to actually climb and ski it. But I still felt like I'm like still in this mentor phase, still like chasing Jer. He'd been doing this for years prior, but I'm like kind of on his heels. And it wasn't until 2019 where finally we shared the same goal at the same time. And that goal was Meteorite Mountain. Um, so Jer had actually ridden Meteorite um, in the heydays of Alaska heli skiing. It's about 20 years ago. He rode it out of a helicopter with the Jones brothers and uh, Dean Conway and those legends of Alaska heli skiing. And he said at the time, that's the best run in Alaska. And as he started to get into the more human powered stuff, he, he at points was like, I, my goal is to climb and ski this. And I found that out when I went into the TGR office and, and Jackson Hole and I saw on the whiteboard, it said, Jeremy Jones, meteorite. I'm like, what's that mean? And it's the production crew at TGR and they're like, oh, Jerry wants to try and ride meteorite this year. He's tried it a couple times already to climb it, but hasn't gotten it. I was like, can I, can I go? That's on my list too. And uh, they're like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. And so I called Jer up. Jer was like, yep, let's do it. And so we set off in late April. We had actually a perfect weather window. We set off to climb and ski meteorite. Um, so getting straight to the day, um, as any good alpine start and ski mountaineer would tell you, you do start very early. I woke up at one, we started hiking at 1.45 in the morning. And immediately we got cold feet. And I'm not saying we got nervous and turned around, I'm saying our feet were actually really, really fucking cold because we had to walk through this river every day <laughs> to get to our line. So at about 2, 2.30 in the morning, take your shoes off, take your socks off and walk through a glaciated river. Um, and that precludes, this was actually the fifth time I had walked through this river because one of the things I didn't tell you was it took two days just to figure out how to get to the base of Meteorite Mountain. Um, obviously, it's a classic heli ski line and there are people that have climbed it, but there's no bait out there, there's no trail, and you end up whacking through the Alaskan jungle. Um, I remember I showed up before Jer and I, he called me, he's like, how's it going? I'm like, ah, I just came back in town to buy a machete and flagging tape. And uh, that's how it went. For the first day, I pretty much sent just trying to find some sort of access point. 
and spent about six hours walking through rivers, hacking my way through the jungle, trying to find some easing breaking point to get into our line. The next day, Jer showed up and we did it again. And we actually walked, figured out our route through, walked all the way to about halfway to the base of Meteorite, kind of set the trail for what we knew was gonna be a very early dark start so that we wouldn't get lost along the way. So the day of, um, we had about six miles to get to the, just the base. And uh, again, it was slow going. We had the, the bushwhacky kind of feel to it. Um, I think we covered the first three miles in like two, two and a half hours without covering any vert. Just slow going and schwacky. And as we got to the base of it, um, we hadn't covered almost any vertical and we started at about sea level. And it doesn't rise up much. And from kind of where the, the five is to the top of meteorite is six and a half thousand vertical feet. So we had a long way to go and we had already been on the trail at this point, probably for, I would say three and a half, probably three and a half hours. And as we got to it, uh, we had our first crux of the day, which is on that lower slide, you see that little chute. That was our only access point to, in the upper slide, the, the glacier and the base of meteorite. And so we could see those old wet slides. We could see that getting off this late in the afternoon is gonna be pretty hairball. And we knew we were gonna to have to move, move fast through that. That was kind of a, um, a crux point of just even getting to the base of the line. Little did we know, I thought it was gonna be refrozen avalanche debris. It was refrozen five inches of crust with pure sugar below it. And so we were sinking up to our waists for the first 3,000 vertical feet, breaking through a point so you'd get one step and do that torturous you step, you start to step up and then it just sinks down and you all of a sudden go to your thigh. And we were just like burning a ton of energy just trying to get to the glacier. Um, I think, I don't even have a good photo of it because the whole time that was happening, you're just swearing angrily and being so pissed off at what that's happening at that moment. And we would just swap like literally 10 steps someone would take and you'd be exhausted and then the next person gets 10 steps and the next person. And this was the only place that actually started to ease up and it was only like knee deep. So, um, but eventually we got up to the glacier and uh, we put on the rope and on our skins and got to the base of it. And I think this was the moment of this entire thing. It doesn't even start with the end of it. It starts at this moment. When we got to the base of it, it was this kind of defining moment where I realized all of this mentorship, all of the, my experiences kind of led up to this point. Because as we started looking at that line, there's line A there. That's the most normal route. So like I said, it has been climbed and skied. And everyone we talked to that said they'd climbed and skied it all went up route A. And it looks pretty straightforward. Um, you know, you have a natural slough running, probably down the middle. It's probably gonna be pretty hard pack, pretty fast travel. And then you look at line B and that looks really scary. You're on a knife edge ridge line and you're hyper exposed for 3000 vertical feet. Plus you might end up having uh, deeper snow and it might be slow, more slow going. But both Jer and I, before we could even almost say anything, we both arrived at the point where we're like, we're going route B. We're going up the ridge line. And I remember we both, it was like almost unspoken and almost like we just knew exactly that we're going Route B and not because it was more exposed because Route B is far more safe. So when you're on these high points of ridge lines, you don't have any chance of things coming down on you. The only thing you have to control is yourself. And that is something you can control. Whereas line A, you got this wall, this east and south facing wall hanging above you at all times. There's rocks that can fall off that, there's ice, there's slough, and there's avalanches. You have no control of that. So at that point, you should opt for the more scary route, but it's actually the more safe route. There's something I've found with like climbing couloirs and climbing in little basins, it feels safer, but it's often way more dangerous. And what we had heard, nobody had actually climbed up Route B, but Jared and I, both with our evaluation, both with all the lessons they learned, knew that was by far the safest option. Because although you are exposed, 
it really would take work to fall off it. Like you are in snow, it is very secure. You have crampons, ice axes, plates on. Like I kind of say like you try and sometimes you'd almost try to let your foot slip and you just kind of like sink down. Like you'd actively have to like jump off. <laughs> And although it's definitely scarier, it again, it's far more safe. And I realized that was like, that we came to the same conclusion. I was like, all right, this is, you're getting to that point. So we started climbing up the spine and we had amazing climbing conditions. Um, it was definitely a little powdery, but it was like uh, boot top deep, perfect climbing conditions. We were just kind of having a ball. Um, we'd swap leads, go 200 feet, break trail. Next part, you go to the back of the line, get your energy back up and kind of do that the whole 3,500 feet up. And I mentioned too, like, although it felt kind of definitely scarier, it was one of the more beautiful spots I've ever been. And you can see those three little dots of just climbing up this like hyper exposed ridge line and just feeling like you're in absolute space. And yeah, sure, it was scary, but you can control your own fear. And I can't control rocks and avalanches coming down on top of me. So we knew we were going, uh, we were in a safe place the whole time. Um, one other actually lesson I learned, and this is all from Alaska. So everyone says in climbing, uh, don't look down, you know? And I was like, oh, it's so scary when you look down. I've actually found the opposite for climbing in snow. Um, quite often, I get more scared when I look up. Because when you look down on a, like a powder slope or a run, you often kind of fans out and slowly gets more mellow. So even though it is 3,000 feet below you, it doesn't have the visual intimidation. But you look up, and especially in Alaska, and the freaking tops of those things just like crest like a wave. It feels like you're climbing a cresting wave. And sometimes you look up and you're like, it's already steep. How is it going to get even steeper than this? Um, but uh, I wanted to show you what it looks like because you just feel like you're, it feels like you're nearly climbing vertical. You're actually not, you're sinking down a bit, but man, does it feel steep. Uh, one more picture as we start to make our way up. And again, these last, that last 200, 300 feet where that rock band is to that, that's where it got absolutely butt puckering steep. But again, I knew at this point through the experience, like I can control my fear. I know this is what I like to call irrational fear. Um, rational fear would be being in the gully of that thing and being worried about stuff coming down on you. Irrational fear is being on exposed ridgeline that you'd actively have to jump off to fall off and being scared. It just felt scary, but there actually wasn't true danger in it. So we kept making our way up, um, just sharing great photos because they're just beautiful. And we made it to the summit. 12 hours later, after starting from the car, and I love this photo because it definitely was a candid moment. Um, this is from Nick Allegre. He was flying around in a, a helicopter with TGR who was filming our whole climb and our whole ski. And just all of a sudden, you know, we can see the frame of the window in there and it's just this moment. And yeah, we were hugging. And because there's something I've found in climbing lines and skiing lines like this that I haven't got in other forms of skiing. Like skiing is an individual sport. But I kind of feel like the subjective style skiing and this like ski mountaineering, it's, it's a team sport disguised as an individual sport. Sure, you have to ski the mountain by yourself and you're ultimately kind of climbing it by yourself. But the reality is it's the combined power of your team that is making the decisions that day, that is breaking trail, that is setting leads, that is making evaluations on the way up. And it's truly a team effort. And these moments like that, they're spontaneous and it's the only time you'll get to the top of something or to the bottom of the line, you feel like hugging your partners. And that just happened because it was just natural. Like you're so fired up to be on top of that peak. And yes, Bjarne, who's in the back, he joined in for a menage a trois hug or something like that. And yeah, um, we all kind of just celebrated that accomplishment of getting up to the top of it. But again, the bonus, of ski mountaineering is you get to ride back down. Um, so there's Jer on his second time riding meteorite on just riding the exposed ridge line right next to the boot pack of our way up, laying down just classic style, absolutely shredding that peak after spending 12 hours hiking it. 
and me, I had my moments. I definitely not realized, although I felt equal at moments to, to Jer, he still, uh, he's such a master. I, I kind of flailed at the top section, but I had, I had my moments as you can see here and uh, got down to the bottom and was just filled with absolute pure stoke. And this is something that I've found in this new aspect of skiing. And I've found stoke in all forms of skiing. And I'll never tell you anybody that any form of skiing is better, is cooler than another form of skiing. But at, at this moment in my life, climbing up and skiing down mountains is where I'm finding the most joy, finding the most challenge. And when you get done with these things, I, you can't explain it's not accomplishment, it's not reward, it's not conquering, it's not success. There's something all-encompassing about it, of being a part of nature, of spending time in the mountains, of at points it feels spiritual, at points it feels absolutely like the most mental challenge you've ever gone through, at points the most emotional challenge you've ever gone through. And I feel just more human when I'm climbing up and skiing back down mountains. And there's, I, there's, Truly, words have not been invented in English to describe the feeling of it. You just have to do it. And again, it was kind of the first time I, I shared a goal that with Jer. I did the same thing that he had set out 20 years prior to do. And I was felt for the first time like, okay, like you're maybe not equal, but you're, you can hang, you're up here. And that felt like, the graduation for me. It felt like everything I'd been learning over the last 35 years as a skier, 20 years as a professional skier, and five years of working my way into climbing up and skiing lines came to this moment from the mentorship of people like Jimmy, from Chris Rubens, Dave Treadway, and Jeremy Jones to making these decisions, climbing up something confident like that and skiing meteorite, a peak I once was absolutely terrified of and said I would never ski. Um, but the reality was we still had to walk out. <laughs> so there is that to it too. And there's still some suffering and some type two fun and we had to cross that damn river one more time. Um, I dry heaved like three or four times on the way out because I was so exhausted. Um, the actual river felt good for the first time because our feet were so in so much pain from being in for them. And we had a 17 hour days of car to car to, to ride and ski meteorite. But as I told you in the beginning, it's the best stories of the 50 Project so far because I got 20 left and I've got some of the hardest lines left and I still feel like I'm learning along the way to get to these next three hard lines because although I'm 30 lines in, I feel like I'm, I'm doing this, I know the next challenges I'm, um, I'm coming up against, I will be learn having to learn more, train harder, and push myself in new ways to enable to try and climb and ski them. And some of the ones I've got left are lines like Mount St. Elias, uh, the mirror face on that, which has only been skied once in history. I've got University Peak, one of the absolute behemoths. Um, this was actually the line that first drew me in, ironically, what I think the hardest line in the book, and it was probably from Naivete that I looked at that on the cover of the book and thought, I wanna ride that one day. Um, but that 8,000 foot uh, face, one of the most prominent faces in the world, uh, it's only been supposedly skied twice ever um, from the top. And that's, that's on the list, that's in the book. And I say it keeps me awake at night and I might get to the base of that thing one day and say, nope, I'm not riding it. But I'm gonna find that out when I hopefully get to the base of it. And it may take me one try, it may take me 20 years to ski, but I'm gonna give it that time. And the last one, the legendary north face of Mount Robson, which was skied for first in 1995, and its second descent was in 2017. A line that rarely comes in, hyper steep, three and a half thousand vertical feet of ice, rock, rocks, and tricky navigation to wait for potentially one day out of five years that it can come into condition. So this is another one that's gonna take a while. And, Another one along the way that I'm hopefully going to continue to learn about these mountains and learn as a, as a human, as a skier. And say fin. So that is it. That is me, the new ski mountaineer, right? That's how you're supposed to look, right? But, uh, but yeah, so um, for all you out there, 
um, stick around. We have a live Q&A with me coming right up, and I hope you enjoyed it. Awesome. Well, welcome back, guys. Cody, what a show, dude. So epic. Thank can't, you. Can't wait to see more, more stories from the 50 Project. Um, but we're going to get right into it in a second. I want to tell the audience first, though, that just the raffle alone, uh, which is far and away a record, has raised uh, over $17,000 um, for the Boys and Girls Club of North Lake Tahoe. And when we pair that with the anonymous um, donor party amount, um, who, if anyone listening needs a year-end tax write-off, uh, wants to join the club, definitely uh, holler at me. Um, that puts us over 75 grand, uh, which is far and away a record. So kudos to everyone watching. Much love. It's it's uh, really really special. We appreciate it. Um, but the first question uh, tonight is from Daniel Cates, uh, the owner of Technical Equipment Cleaners, Aaron Truckee. And his question is, how hard was it to get Jimmy Chin out of bed before the Grand? Does Daniel have experience with this? He must, right? He's got to have it. Because, uh, yeah, no, he actually is hard to wake up. Like, the, the night before, we were like, all right, we're, you know, waking up at 2 or 1.30 or whatever. And he's like, all right, wake me up at, like, 1.45, like, 15 minutes before we're supposed to go. I was like, you don't need a coffee and breakfast? He's like, no, just... 15 minutes and sure enough we it's on camera in the episode waking him up and he's just like what we have to go <laughs> that's like the one non-alpinist trait that i've seen out of jimmy so yeah like, daniel telling me something i don't know yeah he must we need to talk to daniel about that totally yeah okay so jim farley um i know this is all about the best three so far but what's been the worst line <laughs> so far um well, technically, it wasn't necessarily the best three. It was just kind of three very memorable ones or poignant ones for for myself. There was some other ones that I think, like, pure ski quality were almost better than those. But um, but I would say for the worst, oof, it's a tie between, I would say, the Watson Traverse was terrible. Um, I came into the project thinking tra traverses were dumb and I'm probably going to leave the project with my opinion unchanged um, because I've realized that traverse is just like a French word for no skiing <laughs> and uh, you end up just walking a lot and uh, the Watson Traverse although it takes you to a beautiful spot takes you to a rad summit you, we did like 12,000 feet of climbing I think we skied like 2,000 vertical feet it oh, felt gosh. like you really don't ski much and then you did like 16 miles of walking so it was felt it was just an extended hike and you know i've come to more appreciate hiking but that one yeah i don't know I, I can see its appeal it's a classic it's like a hundred year old route it was you know uh first ski to like in the 1920s 1930s so the the, the classicness of it is definitely there um and then the funny one the the day was really special to me, but in terms of skiing, it was by far the worst, and it felt very ironic um, because it was the sickle cooler with my wife on her first ever true ski mountaineering kind of expedition. Um, not expedition, but day, using ice axes, crampons for the first time, steep and exposed and all that, and well, oh, no. the conditions were heinous. I mean, I sandbag her so hard. <laughs> It was like, we were joking around with it. I'm like, your introduction was hopefully like some of the worst you can get of skiing when it comes to this sort of skiing. Right. And uh, hopefully it gets better from here, but I definitely did not win her over with that day. But it was like a special day to me because it was like showing her what I've been doing. She's definitely still into skiing powder more than I am for good reason. And so I, I really enjoyed the day and going out there with her, but man, I say it back to her. But you're still married, so that's all good. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. The episode is called Marriage Test in the Mountains, and it truly was. It's and a good one, for sure. We, she was laughing at the end of the day, so I consider it a win. Right. Okay, from uh, Javier S., have you kept in touch with the skier or hiker that was involved in the accident on uh, Joffrey, and what exactly happened that resulted in the accident? 
Yes, I have kept in touch with him. Um, I actually received some incredibly kind messages from his, some of his friends and some of his family um, and received some kind messages from him. Um, he wasn't released out of the hospital for nearly a month. Um, I don't know the, the full extent of his injuries, um, but I do know that they were pretty severe, but at the same time, not as severe as I would have, could have anticipated or even witnessed what I thought. Um, but he wasn't allowed to fly home. He was from Austria um, for a month because of some of the injuries he sustained. Um, but yeah, I've actually here and there, he randomly texts me and he says he owes me a beer. And I'm like, yep, that's all you owe me, just one beer. That's good. Um, but uh, yeah, I've, I've kept in touch with him randomly, Bjarne and I both. So um, that's been cool to kind of stay in touch with that guy. Yeah, nice. This is a good one. These are all really good questions, actually. Um, from uh, Wyatt, um, who's a local here in Tahoe City who we love. Uh, which of the 50 lines are you most concerned could become not viable due to global warming? Yeah. Um, well, the two that I've witnessed pers personally was Joffrey Peak. And if the people are out there, they don't know what happened to that. But after um, the incident, the rescue, the um, our crazy kind of gnarly ski descent that summer nearly the whole north face of that mountain collapsed and we talked about it in the episode because the glaciers receded so much it's making some of the lines more difficult and they weren't filling in properly anymore making the like the exit kind of big massive steps and cliffs and uh so it was already a factor and then um, because, you know, you can't exactly say this event was created because of climate change, but you could say it helped contribute to its fall um, because of some of the data that's coming out with alpine rock slides and mountain collapses uh, and how they've accelerated through pretty much throughout the globe. We're seeing them in the Himalaya and the Alps and up in Alaska. So the, pretty much the whole North Face collapsed, and there's three possible ski lines on it and two of the lines are forever done. Um, they just, yeah, they're, they're gone, they vanished. They're a giant cliff face now. Now the third line, which is the line we actually skied, still seems doable to me. Um, it still exists there, though I've heard from friends that there's like maybe like almost a six foot wide crevasse of rock in the middle of it now. Um, and there's the potential it could fall off again soon because the crack continues, the crack that developed continues through that portion of the face. Um, so I think it's maybe still skiable, but it might not be. Um, the other one was the Watson Traverse, um, which I kind of mentioned too. Like the glacier is receding so fast on Mount Baker that where we were skiing down, um, we'd seen pictures from five years prior and it seemed like a wide open glacier field. Granted, it was a low snow year, but Bjarne and I were so sketched out, we were skiing on a rope on 25 degree slope because the crevasses were so huge and so unbridged. Um, and then, um, funny enough, like two of the cruxes too, like uh, south of, of, of University Peak, that Bertrand continues to grow up to the face and we're, it's getting to the point where in the next 10 years it may be impassable. Um, and the ice is receding to the point where the snow isn't necessarily sticking as well. Same goes for Mount Robson. Mount Robson, the ice is starting to melt off that north face and go down to the rock, and then at that point it becomes a cliff face um, because as it gets kind of receded, it gets a little steeper throughout. So uh, those two are like kind of the ones on my radar, which are like those are pretty much going to be done in the next. I don't know if it's. Five years, ten years, twenty years, or fifty years, but there's going to be a point where those are unskiable. Right, and those are the last two are the remaining lines, right? Totally. Yeah, still have those ones to go. And heck, I don't know all the other ones. They they, they could change. <laughs> right, totally. Well, the next question is from Zach. Uh, what are the classic descents in Lake Tahoe? <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> I'm telling you, I have to kill you. No, um, I mean, probably the most classic descent is like uh, the, the couloirs on the north east, northwest face of, of Tulac and you know, Holy Cross and some of those other things. I think those are the ones that uh, are def would meet the definition of a classic in the, in the Tahoe area. I think we all have our own powder stashes here, but I don't know, would you agree as a Tahoe guy, Tulac, probably? Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. Maybe... 
some stuff on the East Shore too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. There's, yeah, there's, um, and this is actually, yeah, I guess the East Shore could be, yeah, there's some good stuff over there. But we can't talk about it in too much specifics, or uh, some of my old schoolers might burn the shop down, so we'll, totally. like that. we'll let you find it for yourself. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not that hard there. to find. <laughs> it's out there. Go adventure for sure. Um, so this is from David Nicholas, a uh, friend from South Lake. How do you balance going on epic expeditions with marriage? Oh, um, with the most unbelievably supportive wife ever. Um, as we all know, it's that the old, uh, old uh, adage of, you know, behind every strong man there's a strong wife. And it's very true. And I think mine's maybe potentially stronger than me. Mm -hmm. But uh, the other thing is that she's a professional skier herself. And so we come from the same kind of, the same background, we have the same desires and we understand each other and understand the lifestyle that this job is. Cause she, you know, yeah, I'm gone a lot, but she's gone a lot too. <laughs> like we won't see each other for a while because she's filming and I'm filming, we have to be separate. So um, the good thing is we have off season and we spend a lot of time together that way. Yeah, uh, nice. And Elise is definitely, um, she was, uh, I didn't mention in the test pass in the slideshow, but I definitely should have been me asking her throughout the years prior about it, talking to her about it, asking for her permission and all that. Right. Yeah, she's an amazing lady. Um, so next up from Jacob, uh, can you talk about your mindset when it comes to facing fear and overcoming it? Yeah, generally I try to draw back on prior experiences. Um, and if I don't have that is when I tend to get scared. And by drawing back on prior experiences to make that next step, it's all about baby steps. And that's why I kind of, we talk about backcountry skiing, big mountain skiing, how it's, it's a game of decades and why some of the best skiers on the planet are in their thirties and potentially even older when it comes to ski mountaineers. Cause like truly it is experience that either plays to being safe and successful in the mountains, in my opinion. And, and when it comes to the fear, the other thing I try and do is break down rational fear versus irrational fear. So um, I talk about it in, in the slideshow, but you know, being on an exposed ridge line seems very scary when we're climbing up the spine of meteorite. Right? It looks scary. All the photos are dramatic and scary, but the reality is it was actually very safe and safer than the reeds climbing the face because it would take a lot of effort for us to fall off of it. Nothing was going to come down on us to, to slide us off our position. So um, then when you kind of break those down, you start to kind of calm down and start using your more rational senses to be like, yeah, this is steep. This feels really scary. Everything in my emotions and body is going like, ah, but you can kind of calm yourself down. They're like, no, all all of my observations are pointing to what I'm doing right now is safe, right? It's like mountain self-talk. Yeah, a lot of self-talk. <laughs> um, okay, from Scott Shipman. Um, how has growing up skiing in Tahoe helped prepare you for the extreme lines that you've skied? Um, I think it points to the culture here and the people here. Um, you know, like... Squaw Valley, my home, is an amazing resort for learning how to ski small lines, technical features, steeps, all that stuff. You learn a lot of technical skills there. But I think, like I point to in the slideshow as well, so often, it's like the people that are here before me, the people that have paved this way and the culture that that's developed around this unique home, I think is the reason why it prepared me to do all this stuff. I mean, from the legends we know on screen to all the underground legends that you don't even hear about, like there are so many badasses up here. And um, I think through that experience and all the mentorship and the culture that's been built around it is the only reason I'm here today, I think. Yeah. Well, and I really appreciate it in the show how you kind of paid homage to, you know, words of wisdom that might have been piped from generation to generation of alpinists and, and ski mountaineers is super rad. And I feel like that's very alive in, in Tahoe, too, in the backcountry. Um, from uh, Michael Steig, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, what advice would you give to your younger self? 
Um, you know, it's, a, I guess, a little bit of, yeah, be patient. I think one of the things when you're young is you're not patient. And um, it took me a long time to get here. I tend to call myself the 10-year overnight success story. Like when I, the, the crack went viral and blew up and it put me on the next level and people were like, oh, you're a star. I'm like, I've been doing this for 10 years. So <laughs> like, I've been a professional skier for a while. Um, so the patience and um, I don't know. I feel like I've where I am at is exactly where I wanted to be at. So I don't feel like I've made too many big mistakes necessarily. There's very few things I would look back on and regret. I, I love my life. I'm very happy and I'm very lucky. So it's not too much I would tell myself. Yeah, I'm, glad I'm, I'm lucky like that. Yeah, you're here for a reason. Yeah, totally. Okay, from uh, Jamie, such great stories. I'm glad you enjoyed the show, Jamie. When will you continue the 50? Um, and you're at 30, correct? So I'm at 30, which is actually news to a lot of people. So I will say you guys are kind of actually the first to know this. And I'm like just waiting on confirmation that I should be having a movie coming out on Monday. So, and it's part of the 50. But I'm like been up day and night trying to finish this thing. Right. Um, so potentially Monday, the actual uh, an episode, which is a long episode, which can be constituted as a film, should be coming out on Monday. Awesome. Um, but the actual resumption of the project itself, like going in skiing lines, um, probably late February, early March is when I'm going to get going. Um, the, the hard part of this project is so many of the lines are concentrated into the prime ski mountaineering months, which are spring, and a majority of these definitely are. And I was very diligent on, on it in first year one to like leave some of the early season lines that I knew were doable early season. Like I just wouldn't do them because I'm like, oh, I can do it next year and work on some of the spring stuff. But with spring being canceled this last year, mm -hmm. um, it's really concentrated it back down to spring. So I'm probably going to put, put most of my efforts into the spring. That's why I'm training so hard because I know how exhausting it's going to be and how hard we're going to be going. So I kind of want to prep and ease my way into it and then ramp up to a full, like, absolute sprinting pace um, in, the, in the spring. Sweet. So stay tuned, right? Yeah. Um, so I think our last question um, is how, how do you feel? Um, you know, we've wanted you to be involved in speaker research for a long time. Um, we'll get you back to do it in person. Um, but how does it feel to kind of stand on your athletic feats and your personality, specifically for this show, to inspire people and, and raise money for you know, a nonprofit that's so close to your own, you know, heart? I'd say it feels surreal to me still because I feel like I'm just like a still that dreaming kid pro skier that wants to be a pro skier. Like I don't necessarily feel like I'm that and because I still feel at heart. I'm just like a, a kid that's obsessed with skiing and just loves it and wants to keep doing it. So it sometimes feels surreal to be like get to invited to do these things and have to pinch myself of being like, oh, no, like, the, like, you're here and people are like care about these stories and I'm like, whoa, that's that's cool. <laughs> Still yeah. kind of uh, Google eyed about it. But then uh, but when it comes to like supporting the community and doing all that kind of stuff, then yeah, it makes me feel a lot better because I always say that like skiing is a very inherently selfish sport, that we do it for fun and to make a living off of doing something for fun is a very selfish pursuit. So as long as I can figure out ways to at times when I'm not doing that, give back and work towards an end goal of giving back to everything, to the mountains and this community which is given to me, then I'll feel like it was kind of a circle is complete. Otherwise, I feel like I'm a taker and not a giver. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be just a taker. I want to make sure that um, whether it's 
you know, mentoring young people, like I was so lucky enough to get mentored by so many people, um, or whether it's uh, giving back to this community, making sure it stays strong so that people uh, have a chance to ski and grow up here and do amazing things like I was fortunate enough to do, then, then I want to do that. Right on. We well, are humble too. We love that about you. <laughs> I appreciate it for sure. Yeah. But guys, that's all we have time for. Um, a big shout out to Cody uh, for, for giving up his time in a really busy uh, part of the year. And um, thank you to Peak Designs and the Boys and Girls Club. Definitely tune back in in early January with Angel Collinson, an amazing uh, North Face free scheme um, woman who you will be impressed by. And happy holidays. Thank you so much. Thank you.